Hello, welcome to the Wasting Time podcast. I am one of your hosts, Chris, here as ever. And I am joined with... <laughs> Well, I mean, you don't need to make a dig like that. <laughs> uh, here, as ever, un- unlook, unlook, unlike my co-host. Unlike my co-host, Nick, which I promise, Nick, as I said that, I did not mean that as a dig. <laughs> but as it came out, I was like, oh, this sounds like a bit of a barbed comment. It's, I mean, there, there isn't much defence, so it's... Uh, <laughs> well, there is defence, but I mean, you know, it's, as a matter of fact, you're very, very right to say that you are here every time. <laughs> Whereas I'm just here occasionally I, at the moment. I'm like the Mark Hoppus of this podcast, like uh, in what in whatever uh, whatever form it's been, like I've been always the constant host on whatever episode. Right. And are you putting me in the Tom John category? Is that what you're saying? Oh, I, no, I mean, I haven't gone. No, on... I'll, I'll give you Travis at least. All right, okay, fair enough. I was going to say I haven't gone off and started a, a new podcast with a bit of <laughs> reverb ad, added to it. <laughs> um, uh, so on that's that's a nice little segue. Did you watch the Coachella? Either Coachella performance? Do you get a chance? I've watched just like bits. So I haven't watched like the whole thing. Yeah, end to end, which I'm sure you should have probably probably more than once so um, is my guess so, so 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 yes the first one i watched twice and then the second one i've only watched bits of i haven't watched the whole thing right okay well yeah i mean i've just watched a few few songs and a few um yeah extracts of them dicking about like they always used to yeah and what yeah. did you make of that did it make you wish that you'd been there uh, oh absolutely yeah man. i look like a a special moment for those for those people just like that opening opening moment where they came out and stuff yeah. it would must have been pretty amazing to be there yeah 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 um just got to carry it on now through like the 80 fucking odd dates or something <laughs> they've got in the diary on their will exactly too. do you reckon they're gonna get through the whole thing i let's see let's see there's a lot of skeptics out there that don't think yeah uh, go yeah. the full run yeah it'll be interesting to see how it pans out but i mean it'll be it'll, it'll be imp- yeah impressive just like i know he's made a full full recovery but just for mark to do like something like that that's like pretty yeah, huge sure. yeah like, coming out of remission and stuff Um but yeah you you catching a catching one you are you're going to copenhagen copenhagen yeah hey, yeah there you go yeah well remembered. Thank you. Thank you. When's that one? Uh June, it's not July. Mid- no, no further away than that. It's mid September. So a little little few months away now. Was there anything else on the Coachella bill that was notable? It's a bit not really not pay with, much attention to Coachella when it comes to around. be honest, yeah, it's not really music I'm familiar with. Like I looked at the lineup and like I think Knocked Loose was like basically the only other thing I really knew. Oh well, I mean that's an exaggeration. There were there was stuff I was aware of, but like there wasn't too much that I would listen to, so I didn't really pay much attention. Yeah, it's not exactly when we were young, eh? Well, exactly. I think that's more in our lane. Let's be <laughs> let's be honest. Uh, so, what else has been happening whilst I've been, um, yeah, looking after a five month old? Let's see. So, so I've done a couple of interviews, which we'll, we'll come to in a minute. Because uh, obviously this is the intro for one of those. But yeah, aside from that, oh yeah, I just got back from Berlin because I went went to see the boys in Love Breakers playing with Elvana, which was all kinds of fun. Really good time, and uh, big thanks to Elvana for taking taking them again. Can't 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 really thank them enough for that. But yeah, it was a good time. Germany, you got to see a little bit of the punk scene in Germany this this time little around. Bit, few of the yeah, bars and stuff. Yeah. The, Kreuzberg area of Berlin, which is, if you're into your punk rock, a very fun place to spend an evening. Do we have anywhere like that in this country? Like an area? I, I suppose Camden's probably got a bit of a. But yeah, really... Ca- Camden, like East London, has been like that at times, but you know, maybe not as consistently as it seems to be over there. I, w- I went on Google Maps and I just typed punk bar and just millions popped up. And I was just thought, oh, it would just mean like they're a dive bar that has that kind of vibe about it. But we went to a couple and they were just playing like Social Distortion, Rancid, Green Day, Blink, 
Pennywise, all that kind of stuff in both of them. So I was like, oh, okay, they are actually punk nice. punks, literally. Yeah. And your wife, your wife kind of went along for the ride with you as well without she did. too much. She did. Yeah. She didn't want to yeah, go she... any nice cocktail bars at any point. Like, no, she yeah. she was very happy to go to them. I'm happy to say and yeah. uh, enjoy it. Did well then. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I'd have the same kind of success. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it would definitely be entertained for a short while, but I would yeah. think it would probably it would have an expiry right. like, <laughs> like after a couple of drinks, maybe. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, well, we'll maybe have to pencil it in for a, for a trip. Yeah, that would be great. Further down the line. My wife's just come in and just said, I heard that. <laughs> so, I mean, I'll tell you, and it's, it's the truth. Are you partial to a cocktail too? You, I'm, yeah, pretty sure it's partial to a cocktail. That's so. true. That's true. <laughs> I mean... I'm sure these punk rock bars were serving cocktails as well. We shouldn't. <laughs> but, yeah. Anyway, what's uh, anything to enlighten me with in terms of new music? Because that's another thing I've. Yeah. Have you really... have you checked out anything recently? <laughs> uh, no, not really. I did okay. see that uh, Gaslight Gaslight got some new music coming out. So... Yes, at the time of recording, so it'll be out by the time this is out. But they have uh, they have a new single, which is very exciting. We haven't heard it right now but by the time you're listening to us we will have heard it but unfortunately so, yeah. we can't share it we'll have to share our thoughts on it next time that'll be on my my list to check out but uh, yeah i've just been shit really to be honest with you mate um okay all those kind of things um i'll give you a couple of things i've listened to before before that i should also do a plug because love breakers have a new single out which will be out when you're listening to this, it will be out uh, attracted to your fashion. So please check that out as well. Um, yeah, but Rancid had a new song out, which I wasn't really feeling, but given it's ahead of a new yes, album. I have listened uh, to that. Yeah, it was all right. New album's out in June, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Parisha and I are going to gonna go to that Rancid show. Um, you know, the one Grade 2 are on. So that should be Yeah. Fun. Nice. Uh, uh, what, is it Wembley? Wembley? Yeah, it's just been up, up. It's moved to Wembley. It was at Brixton originally. So I grabbed a couple of tickets for that. That should be good. Rust Rust and Kelly, which is kind of sort of punk adjacent music. I'd describe it as a bit more kind of folky as well. Like I've been enjoying his new album. I don't know if you're familiar with him at all. Yeah, kind of stuff's that. It's sort of country folkish, but like he's from, he's kind of from the same background as us because he's he's historically put out, um, covers in his style of music of things like blink and dashboard confessional and stuff um okay. so yeah I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to see if you'd like that check out his his most recent album it's called the weakness yeah his his publicist did did say we might be able to have him on the show but i haven't heard an update on that because he'd be he'd be quite an interesting guy he, he was married to casey musgraves until recently who's like a mega star these days something else that that that's come out recently that i think i can't remember if i sent over to you or not but I'll be curious to see your, your reaction. It's this guy. He 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 puts out music as it, it's. He calls himself New Wave, but it's like N E W dot W A V. Um, I think he was like in a band like We Are the In Crowd or something like that. Maybe I'm imagining that, but I feel like he was because he's put out covers that have like gained a lot of attention. So he did like um, a 1975 song in the style of Blink, and he, so he does that kind of stuff. But he's just He's in the process. He's put out two parts of it, but it's Dude Ranch in the style as if Jerry Finn had produced it and Travis had done the drums. So right. it's like an enema of, the, enema of the state version of Dude Ranch. And it's um it's really fun. It's really fun. I think I, I think you might enjoy it. If you just if you just search for new dot wave on on, okay. on Spotify, you'll see it in there. Cool. Yeah, we'll do. But yeah, that's kind of it. That's um everything that's been happening music wise recently. Should we, should we move on to today's episode? Yeah, go for it. So so this is a bit of a different one. Um, so I spoke to John Hamps, John Hampson from the band Nine Days. And Nine Days are kind of they're not you wouldn't put them in the bracket of the music that we usually cover, but I but like it's not a million miles away. So obviously Nine Days' biggest song is absolutely Story of a Girl, which has kind of had a bit of a resurgence recently. It's mainly because it's all over the Oscar-winning film, everything, everything, everywhere, all at once. But they're kind of 
is kind of having a moment. So I thought it'd be interesting to to have a chat to him. And I'm so I was a big fan of that song when it came out like 23 years ago. But like I've kind of followed their career since because I really got into all their other stuff. What's what's your experience of Nine Days? I don't remember ever really talking about them with you. Just from that, like, what was it? Where where did the song get famous originally? What movie soundtrack was it? I don't know that it was in the movie. It was just a, it, it was just a really big hit, like more was in it? America than here. But it did do the rounds on MTV over right. here when it was out. It was it maybe on a compilation or something, or yeah. I don't know. Uh, but I mean, that was it really. Like, heard that song loads, you know, and listened to it. it was on some. Mixed CDs, I guess, that yeah. we have back in the day. Did, so you never listened to like any of their albums not that or I, other songs? Not that I remember. Um, maybe through you, were you playing that stuff back in the day? Uh, yeah, I've been like I've been into Nine Days since like before we were friends. So I must have played like yeah, played probably just probably not never you know acknowledged yeah. it as as that. Yeah, yeah. I'd reckon. Ch- you should check out the album that that song's on. I feel like you would like a lot of songs on that album. They're, you know, they're more in the sort of third eye blind, Counting Crows sort of pool of music is okay. where I would put them. All right, okay. Uh, which is something, as as listeners will hear, like John and I do do talk about quite a bit because he was recently on the Less Than Jake guys podcast. So I did ask him about that, which you'll hear in a minute. Cool. Look forward to it. Okay, let's let, let let let's roll it. Thanks so much for doing this, man. I appreciate you giving me a bit of time on your Sunday as well. No problem. I appreciate it. Thank you. How's your weekend been so far? It's been super quiet, super a whole lot of nothing. I was just telling my wife it's it's exhausting doing nothing. It, it's rain. It's like pouring rain here. It was all morning, and I get up pretty early. I'm up by like you know six thirty seven. So mm-hmm. I just you know tinkering around with some music stuff, but just enjoying kind of a lazy Sunday. So it's funny. I have noticed that whenever we've we've communicated on Instagram, like oh, obviously you're several hours behind me, but like. You, right. you always answer quite sharpish and I'm like oh this man is up early for <laughs> east coast time well yeah. so you sort of are you sort of uh New York State area where, where are you based? Yeah. yeah I'm on Long Island I don't know if you're familiar with the area at all but I'm about an hour and a half east of New York City okay okay basically just head straight east and you know you go not not all the way to the end but but a good chunk of the way out uh eastern Long Island that's where I grew up as well Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm, uh, my geography with, with the East coast isn't, I mean, it's, you know, sort of basic knowledge, but every time I've been to the States, it's always been the West coast. So I kind of need to oh, okay. bury that up a little bit. So it's, yeah. So I'm based in Surrey, which is just kind of about half an hour Southwest of, of London. Are you, okay. um, have, what, what's your UK experiences like? Have you been over here many times? I've been over there a few times. Um, as a sort of tourist a couple of times uh yeah. the band came over in september of 2000 and i think i think i was telling you we played the is it the underworld camden am i getting that right you are the underworld and is, yeah. is, is still active in in camden no no i don't think don't think we got to that on instagram so yeah um but yeah i i kind of i guess i kind of just wanted to kind of start with just stuff that's been happening recently with you i've heard you talk about this on a few shows so i won't make you re- hopefully repeat yourself too much it's all good yeah. man don't worry about it so listen to the chris you're on the chris the makes yeah that was very cool that was cool were you were you a fan of less than jake were you familiar with less than jake at all before that i was familiar with them um i was probably playing like clubs at the time when when they first came out like i think we started similar times we might have been a couple yeah. of years behind them um, but, uh, they, I, if I, if I remember correctly at the time, there was sort of a, a, a punk ska kind of movement thing happening sure, at the time. Sure. There were a lot of like alternative rock bands kind of doing that thing. It wasn't our thing. Um, yeah. you know, and you know, when you're in your twenties and, and you're back then, I listen, I don't even know today. I think things are, are really are just so different, but yeah. you know, when, when I was, you know, in my twenties, writing music, playing shows and stuff, things were very, um, I don't want to say rigid, but you know, there were, there was very distinct niches for who was doing what. 
uh, and if you were a po- uh, you know a sort of a punk ska thing, that's what you did. Uh, yeah. and we we didn't really do that, but um, I definitely was familiar with them for sure. Okay, okay, and, the, and I think the other one I this it's kind of linked with that because it's the guy I think he produces that show. I listened to you, you were talking about the Stroke Nine hit on there, uh, One Hit Thunder. Yeah, that was actually pretty funny. Yeah, it's funny. We're we're pretty friendly with the guys at Stroke Nine. Um, I did the the One Hit Thunder on the Stroke Nine song, Little Black Backpack. Yes. And uh, that was just fun because back during the, you know, the quarantine period, like a lot of people, I used to just take these epically long walks uh, for like, you know, an hour and a half, two hours. And so it was just devouring podcasts. And that's how I came across the one hit thunder. They did an episode on story of a girl. So I was listening to it. Yeah. And it's funny. It's like you're eavesdropping in on this conversation about you and I'm going, okay, that that's good. That that was, you know, I was, I was enjoying it, but there was, I was like, all right, they got, I gotta, I gotta clear some, some factual errors up here. And that's how that <laughs> whole dialogue started, but it was a good time. It was fun. Yeah. It's funny you say that. Cause I think, um, I would listen to that podcast about you at the same time. And right. I, I can't remember what, what the inaccuracies were, but even me as a fan, I remember hearing the couple and then I saw right. the little conversation you guys had on Twitter when you were clearing that up. Yeah. It was pretty funny. But yeah, I, I suppose like the, the first thing to discuss is kind of the sort of re- resurgence that your, 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 your big hits been having in recent times. I mean, the obvious thing to talk about is obviously the, the everything everywhere all at once i mean that's that that must have been a very surreal experience that you've had with that and have you had like kind of have people sort of come newly to the band from that at all or is it more just kind of people who are familiar with the song kind of you know making that connection as far as you're aware yeah you know these things are really funny because for me uh, let's say it's you know 20 years since you know the song sort of had its its real moment yeah. It's it's had this very steady presence in sort of my own awareness, you know, like I you know, I work with a publisher and you know, it's it's been pretty steady that, you know, I I I'll get requests to use the song for whatever, a TV show okay. or a movie or something. And um you know, the the funny thing is generally the requests that come in are for shows or movies that, you know, like maybe not really something that I would watch or that I would necessarily go see, but yeah. I'm like, Oh, that sounds pretty cool. And you know, you sign off on it. And it, so for me, there's been this very, it's been this very consistent thing. So I don't really even feel this dramatic shift in, in things w- w- the last year, other than the fact that people seem to be more interested in talking to me about it. Um, okay. Okay. But which is fantastic. I mean, it, it, it's re, it's fun and, and I love it. And uh, I'm always grateful for the opportunities that that song brings. But, you know, with everything everywhere all at once, the difference for me was that, you know, this wasn't just, hey, can we use your song? This was we want to use your song, but we want to actually change some things. We want to rewrite yeah. some lyrics. And there was a creative aspect to it. And I am a huge film fan. And uh, I knew the directors, their work, at least. I didn't know them personally, but sure, and I sure. knew 24 Pictures, who was the the film company. And, and I watched a bunch of their films. So I knew they they, they did really cool films like Midsommar and The Lighthouse and um, The Green Knight. It was, was on its way out, coming out. And I was excited about that. So right off the bat, I was just excited about this one. I was like, this sounds really cool. And yeah, I kept bugging my publisher and saying, Hey, can, can you reach out and, and let them know that I'd love to do the creative part? Cause initially, you know, they just asked for permission to change up some lyrics. It wasn't, can, you know, they weren't asking me necessarily I, to do oh, it. I see. Okay. So I just kept, I just stayed on it. I was relentless. Yeah, like I'm a yeah. film fan. I really would love to do this. I'd love to be involved. And so, you know, I, I, I ended up talking to the directors and they sent me a couple of the scenes and they asked me to write the lyrics to literally, you know, reflect what's happening. Um, So I had fun with it. And so that part was awesome. And and I finished that was almost two years ago, you know, so (laughs) then you just wait. And then, you know, almost a year later it it comes out and I saw it in the theaters and people were raving about it. So it was really exciting. And 
you know, the actor uh, who who delivers the, the lines of the song is an actor who was in movies I grew up with, like Goonies and, and Indiana awesome. Jones. And so that having, you know, being in the theater and watching him speak a couple of lines of that I wrote as his dialogue, yeah. that was yeah. that was just cool. I mean, it's just it's awesome. So, you know, the whole experience, the whole thing has been super interesting and just like one of the you just kind of like I, I can't believe this happened but um but you know uh, you know you just kind of go on with your regular life as all this you know, they're winning 11 oscars and <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah awesome uh but you know it, it, i'm detached from it at this point i you know in that sense you know sure, so sure. it's cool but it's also it's just weird how it just happens just keeps going and that's that it's so cool though, because like you know, throughout your career, you might like particularly uh, like around the turn of the century, you must have had some very surreal moments around the music you're writing. So to have something so many years later like that is oh, really cool, man. Yes, yes, one hundred percent. The other the other thing I noticed recently, and I guess this is probably more in line with what you were talking about in the you know the song gets licensed you know mm -hmm. relatively regularly since since in the last 20 years or whatever but like uh it, it was quite cool when it, it popped up in that apple tv show you shrinking shrinking you know? yeah it just just because of the interaction the character had with the song even adding yes. in like an extra line before the pause you know? <laughs> <laughs> that was those moments are awesome because it's not just the song playing you know there there's the actor yeah, yeah. singing along exactly and she killed it so yeah those <laughs> things are great and plus again Growing up uh, as a kid, you know, Star Wars was huge. So Harrison Ford rolls in at the end of that scene. So come on. It's just, yeah, these things are, they're just awesome. It is awesome. I mean, it's a shame that Sugar Ray got the song that his character said, um, play that song I like and had him singing along. But at the same time, yeah, uh, your, your one was really cool. I can't hear this. I can't hear the start of the song without her little bit before right. uh, when she right. smiles kicks in now it's really surreal yeah, she's great she did a great job also now that this is really recently i think this is this might have been last weekend but i saw you pop up with um wasn't familiar with the singer but they look they look quite well established is it is it geordie the singer yeah that you, you yeah. joined on stage last week and tell me a little bit about that because the instagram clips are an ace man yeah it, that's a fantastic story too and 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 so you know you, you're saying how like uh, how the song has had this resurgence. And in this regard, what's really interesting to me about the story of a girl having this moment again is that it's having this moment through these very different iterations. Like you've got Shrinking sure. and a couple other shows that are using it as a as the song, you know, as it is. And then you've got Everything Everywhere All at Once where I rewrote the song, three different versions uh, that I yeah. rewrote in the film, which is awesome. And then Jordy is an artist who, uh, God, again, going back not quite a year, but last summer, his manager reached out and said, listen, you know, I have an artist and uh, he, he, we've done an interpolation of Story of a Girl and we've flipped it to Story of a Boy. Yeah. Uh, so... You know, whenever I get uh, some something like that, my first thought is just sort of, you know, I'm a little protective of the song. You know, I don't sure. I, I'm not I don't want somebody to kind of take it and sort of poke holes in it or or use it as a punchline. So yeah. I was like, OK, well, let me listen. And I listened to the demo. They sent me over the demo and then I went and listened to Jordy. He, he has an album out bef before this this album. So I checked it out and. He was this fantastic artist, like this fantastic singer, uh, yeah. great melodies, great lyrics. So I, I was super excited about this idea of taking the song and, and sort of switching it. And then I got to meet Jordy out in L.A. They asked me to actually be in his video, which I thought was really funny. I was like, you really oh, wow. sure you want you know you, you want a, an old guy in your video but uh they were awesome uh the director ryan wagner and i talked through it and he came up with this great idea to have me sort of bookend the video um okay. so anyway i meet jordy and and he sits me down like we we meet he comes over and and he just we sit down and he's telling me with this real passion about you know as a as a queer artist you know his, the way he explained it is like this is the song he needed as a kid, you know, he needed to hear a song that, you know, the pronouns were matching what what he felt uh, and it didn't exist. So yeah. I was really 
moved by that, humbled by the whole thing and and how passionate he was. Um, and so he, you know, he did his version of the song, which really, yeah. you know, uses sort of the hook melody and obviously a nod to the lyric, but the song is, is really his own. I mean, he really rewrote okay. the whole thing and not even rewrote, he just wrote this whole song around it. Um, so when he was in New York, uh, last week, he asked me if I would come in and jump up on stage with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the real cool thing about the universe working is he was playing a venue called Irving Plaza and Irving Plaza was, we played there as, you know, nine days, yeah. the night we found out story of a girl went to number one. That's so it was this really full yeah. circle moment. Yeah. And it was so great to be up on that stage with him and, and share this, uh, this song of his and, you know, the message that he's putting out there, just, you know, I, I just think it's, it's really, it's really wonderful. So you know, all these different interesting angles uh, yeah. coming from Story of a Girl that I never in a million years would have imagined or predicted. So that part is is just, uh, it's hard to put it into words, honestly. It's really magical. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. I didn't, yeah, I was ignorant to, to uh, you know, apologies, I was ignorant to the to the backstory there. Um, I'll definitely uh, look into that more. That's that that's really cool. And like, I, you yeah, know, like, I, go on. I, I throw it out there too, because I just thought of it. <clears throat> I know he's doing some shows in the uk so uh you oh, should definitely check it out um but, you know if you want to go you know i'll pass it along to him but his, it's jordy his, his new album's called boy and you should definitely check it out 100 percent. yeah i really appreciate that i'll definitely get straight on to that um but yeah that's so cool like as you say all these different avenues from this song you know this song you wrote so many years ago like when you came up mm -hmm. that hook and it was you know, uh, as i know about the girl that you were dating who, who you're now married to so you know mm -hmm. Let you go into that story too much because I know I've heard you tell it before, <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, it, it, it's really cool, man. Um, but what I would like to do now, if it's cool with you, is just jump into like a little bit of the band's history, just talk about the early days of Nine Days, and um, because like I think I said to you when I first approached, like I've I, I have obviously my gateway song into you guys was Story of a Girl, as I'm sure it mm -hmm. was for a lot of fans that jumped on board since then. Um, but I can remember like you know researching just just as a fan years ago things about you so one thing i remember from those days and correct me if i'm wrong so the was the band originally called nine days because like the first ep or whatever it was you were cutting took like nine days to track or am i a mad is that is that kind uh, of half truth or am i imagining this let's, let's start <laughs> no, <off> that, there. <laughs> it's true and if people ask what's the story behind the band name i'm like it's not a good story <laughs> um, <laughs> there's nothing really great about it but yeah um, yeah, it, we, uh, long story short, when we started the band, um, you know, I was like 22 years old, but I had already spent four years of my life from 18, you know, graduated high school, like trying to get that record deal. That was the sure. thing, you know, get, get sure. signed. And, you know, it was, it, it, we went through the ringer, e even at that age, I had already been through a bunch of different experiences. And I just decided from the get go, like, I am not waiting around for a record company we're just going to go and we're going to write great songs and we're going to go make a record and okay. so we got in the studio we had basically pulled all our money together and i had written this song called nine days of rain and if you're in the studio you have these things called track sheets where it's basically just keeps it literally keeps track of okay here's yeah. where the the kick drum is on this channel and the bass and the guitars and so on so a lot of times people get lazy and instead of writing the full name of the song, Nine Days of Rain, somebody just wrote Nine Days and they dropped it on top of the nice. console. Okay. And it happened to be the last song, the last day, and I'm doing a vocal for it or something. And one of the guys in my band, Brian, you know, says to me, hey, how many days have, you know, we've been in the studio? And I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, this is nine. And he's like, well, that's the name of the band. <laughs> and I was kind of like, oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's that was an, we could not think of a name for the band we couldn't for the life of us we couldn't come up with something so that was the moment i was like okay good enough this works and there you I've go been, yeah i've been there it, it, it's harder <laughs> than people think to me, i think of band names particularly when everyone has different ideas and stuff yeah okay so, so what what sort of year are we in at this point roughly is this early early 90s or approaching mid 90s um the 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 recording of the first the first recordings we did were, were the summer of 1994 okay. but it really took about a year after that it was really about 1995 when when it really kind of 
came together and it and it started to make sense and it um you know we we had a couple lineup changes in the band and, and the five guys that pretty much started it uh coalesced in 1995 around or prior to, to this to this first thing that you did had you been like touring around much or was it more like were you doing it as a local band and just wait until you had some music recorded under your belt before you were able to like push it as a touring band yeah we you know it's one of those things where uh geography plays a, a lot into things and yeah uh, growing up on Long Island, uh, it, you know, geographically speaking, it is literally a long island, you know, and mm-hmm. and uh, we're pretty far out east. So, you know, like if you grew up in a city, let's say anywhere in, in middle of America or something, you can kind of go in any direction and go to another city and play shows. Long yeah. Island, you're pretty much you got to go through New York City. And yeah. so instead of touring, we just did a lot of recording, a lot of writing, and we go and play in the city for, you know, for fans quote unquote but also you you're trying to invite record companies in because they were all yeah. in new york you know so you we did that for a few years um but we we didn't play much outside of our area sort of maybe from boston down to new jersey sort of northeast okay. of the country we played some shows but not true touring okay and then so you said that it was kind of in 95 that the band that you know yeah. went on to be the the crux of nine days was formed did you because did you do a record in nine? Which, which record was was it called? Was it called three? Or am I imagining that the the, the record yeah, that three, had like yeah. ghosts, ghosts in the graveyard on? Yep. And I remember yeah. Mexico, the song that had Mexico <laughs> in it. Like, so yeah. I haven't listened to this this record for a while because it's not streaming services. But yeah, yeah, we did three in like what we'll call indie albums, and okay. um, between ninety five and ninety eight. Okay, and uh, we did one was called something to listen to. These our titles. That's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Something to listen to is the first one. Very, you know, poetic and uh, profound yeah. of us. Uh, and the second indie album we did was called Monday Songs. And and that was because we we did the steady Monday night residency at this club uh, okay. on the island. And it was actually awesome. I mean, for like two years, we were playing there and like mo- there's nothing going on on a Monday night. So it was it was a great way for us to very comfortably no pressure do whatever we wanted we would play for two hours we would just play these epically long shows and we would jam on songs and and if somebody had a new song and we'd work on it in rehearsal i'm like i will try it on monday night and that became sort of a a process of kind of vetting out which songs were going to stick around and after doing that for the better part of a year we've we had this collection of songs that we really liked and we felt good about so we went in the studio recorded another album called monday songs and then uh a year after that we did that album three that you're uh, talking about as well you, the way your songs always worked I, I assume is it the ones that you sing are kind of the, mainly the songs that you've written and then with uh mm-hmm. is it brian brian still brian yes yeah, the yeah. other singer so yeah. were you kind of has it has it always been like since you guys started making music together one of you all bring a song together and then obviously you know uh mostly you know it wasn't by design it it just sort of happened that way uh where we would mostly bring in songs like hey i got this song and yeah you know we we would sometimes have a you know there some of my favorite songs were songs that we wrote where he had a part and i had a part and we put them together yeah. Uh, or, you know, Brian, there's a few songs uh, later on with the band where Brian had this like maybe a really great guitar part and I would just hear a melody and start writing words. Yeah. But most of the time it was he would write a song and I would write a song um, and it worked for a long time where we would just kind of add, you know, musical ideas or arrangement ideas and stuff to each other's songs. And okay. uh, that was kind of the way it worked. OK. So I mean, you mentioned those those years kind of before you started the band, like chasing a record deal and stuff. Obviously, a record deal did happen for nine days. What 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 stage did that come along? So, in spring of ni- almost summer of nineteen ninety eight. Okay, um, we had kind of uh, been through uh, uh, the ringer a bit. You know, we we'd done a bunch of shows for labels. We'd showcased for labels. Um, we had done a production deal that lasted for months where we were in like a a really amazing studio in the city recording demos. 
Uh, but, you know, nothing was really coming out of it. And it was starting to deflate a little bit. Um, right. And because it, it, it's just it's just it's a grind, you know, it's it's hard. And, you know, we as long as we felt we were we were excited and there was momentum, it was easy to keep going. But we yeah. kind of hit this wall and um, I ended up just writing this one song it was called Another Day, which wound up on a soundtrack for a movie called Summer Catch. But yeah, that song kind of opened up the floodgates for me as a writer. And it was the first song I wrote that I realized, oh, wait a minute, this actually, this could get played on the radio. And I'd never really thought that way. You know, I, I just okay. wrote, but it, something clicked with that song. And, and uh, you know, right after that, we actually got our first offer to do uh, with a label based on that song. So I realized, well, oh, okay, okay this this is kind of what everybody's been waiting for is for a song that they think they can work at radio. Um, and uh, the funny thing is a friend of mine sat me down and and the first offer we got for, uh, for a label was with an indie label and it was, you know, it was decent money, but it wasn't anything crazy. And a friend of mine sat me down and he was like, listen, he's like, don't take this deal. He's like, you, you will write a hit. Um, and I don't know how I had the, I have no idea how I had the sort of courage to listen to him and turn that down because I'd been chasing right. it for years, but right, I did yeah. somehow. And, but then about a month later, uh, you know, this I'm, I'm at a gig and I'm there with my then girlfriend uh, and, and, you know, whatever, we get into a little argument and story of a girl pops into my head and I, and I wrote it real fast. Mm -hmm. Half hour. Most of the song was, was pretty much written. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't trying to write a hit. It just, it was just this weird thing where I, yeah. something just clicked in me with with writing, and uh, that changed everything. So all of a sudden, we we're getting chased by the same labels that had turned us down <laughs> for, oh, for two wow. years. So yeah, it was interesting. And we we signed finally in early 1999. Went and did the record. It just takes forever to cool. to finish a record and get the label to put it out. Like the song was written two years before it came out. Yeah. 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 Which is crazy. Wow. But it, so it was literally from that song that all the, the mm -hmm. many labels came. came oh yeah. Through. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. Okay. And then um, obviously doing that record, I mean, what, what was that experience like? Um, and then, the the kind of writing for that record did you have a period where you were all together trying to like write some songs in the practice room or did was it or were most of them written before like the record was tracked when when did the record come out sort of may 2000 so yeah you, did, did you track it sort of late 99 or something like that well so once um once a story of a girl kind of like sparked this uh sort of new kind of energy in the band I just started writing a lot and okay. um, I wrote the story of a girl. I wrote, if I am right around the same exact time, that was the yep. second single off the album. Yep. Um, I wrote revolve right after that and uh, end up alone came out. So like songs were just kind of happening pretty quickly at this point. And once we, once we um, were working with the label, like we were having conversations Yeah. Uh, then we sort of shifted gears and what we would do is we'd go to this rehearsal studio a couple days a week um, and we would just work on songs and they had an eight track uh, digital recorder there at the time. So we would kind of demo up songs and send them off to our A&R guy and um, we narrowed it down pretty quickly to what songs were going to be on the album. And we went okay. down to Atlanta uh, to record the album in May and June. June and July, maybe of, of 1999. Okay. Yeah. So again, you know, the album's done in August and the yeah. label doesn't put <laughs> yeah, the single yeah. out until March. I mean, the, the right. six months that we had to sit there were, were, I was excruciating, just waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, uh, but that's, that's the way it was. Were you able to, um, cause obviously that, that was a very different time in the music industry. Had you kind of, was that your full-time job at that point? Like kind of while you're waiting for, story of a girl to come out because i assume you know you would have had the advance from the major label and stuff like or were you still kind of you would yeah. assume yeah right. it would be right okay. to assume but right. no uh 
I went down to Atlanta, recorded the album. I lived in Atlanta for two months and yep. we did the album and I came back home and very quickly, uh, I think, I, I think I have this right. By the time all was said and done, I think each of us got about $6,000 to live on. Okay. So okay. you can imagine how quickly, yeah. even in 1998 or 99, I yeah. guess, yeah. 6,000 yeah. does not last. Um, nobody course. bought a car. Nobody yeah. bought a guitar. I mean, I didn't even buy a guitar, dude. I, right. um, so the funny thing is I went back to living in my old bedroom, my teenage bedroom. Right. And I got a job. I went back to work. I was working at this bookstore. And yeah. I went back to the bookstore and I'm like, hey, listen, uh, I know I just, you know, quit last year because I got my big record deal, but uh, I, I need a job right now to get oh, wow. me through yeah. Uh, yeah. Till, till this record comes out. And they, you know, they were very cool. They it was, you know, it was fun. So I went back to work at uh, Borders Books and Music. Oh, OK. Yeah, I remember Borders. Uh, yeah. Yep. So from like September through basically through Christmas, just to kind of wait it out and 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 make some money and and yeah so it, it's pretty funny how this stuff happens what what people yeah. imagine and what's a, a reality at least for us as a band yeah um there was a lot of dead time we're just waiting and waiting and waiting and uh yeah i went back to making like six bucks an hour at borders and were you during that period we were a bit nervous in case of like okay the single is going to come out next spring or whatever but what if what if it flops what if no one really picks this up and then <laughs> You know, this is all kind of it's been looking so bright, but it might not happen. Yeah. Did you have those feelings or were you kind of like, no, we've got the major label behind us. We've got these songs, I believe, and we're good. Um, It was a mix of both. I mean, I felt okay. good about the record we had. I felt really good about it um, when, that, when the whole thing was mixed and mastered. Uh, and then it, then really by the time January of 2000 rolled around, I felt pretty good. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were just so anxious to get out and play. And we went out on this like tour. We didn't have an album out. We didn't have a single. I didn't even know how how they pulled it together. But we did like a month long tour just to get out and do something. Okay. Can you remember uh, who that was with? It, uh, God, I, I, I honestly, it wasn't with any big bands. It was like okay. this this mismatch of you know, playing these these clubs up and down the East Coast of and, and going into the mid <clears throat> middle of the country, the Midwest. Um, I, like I said, I, I don't even know how we got on these shows. I mean, some of them, there might have been 20 people there. Sometimes there might have been 200. Who knows? Yeah. But it was just desperation to get out there and play. Uh, and then, you know, by the time they dropped the single in March, then then it just took off like crazy super fast yeah. wow okay that must have been surreal yeah i think yeah i think totally. it, i think in terms of my experience of you i think yeah i can tell you exactly when when it's when the single started doing the rounds on on mtv over here but it felt like sort of late summer of 2000 so i guess a probably months yeah. after it was out it yeah. sounds about right um so that that summer things were crazy for you um what so what was the aftermath of like the single and the record coming out did you get like straight away put on like some big tours like what, what was that what was that yeah about? we um well I, I, the first couple months it was a lot of festivals a lot of radio festivals i mean the way it kind of worked back then and i'm sure it still does to a degree you know you, your record company's trying to get you added to playlists yeah and Fortunately for us, radio was was totally into Story of a Girl. They they were excited to play it, so we didn't have to force it. But you're you're like, hey, put them in heavy rotation, and they'd be like, well, okay, we'll put them in heavy rotation, but they have to play our Spring Fest. So okay, okay. we were happy to do it. I mean, we were getting out and playing in front of these huge audiences with all these like huge rock bands and pop bands. So yeah. we did a lot of that in the spring into the summer, and then. We were touring with um, Stroke Nine and SR Seventy One for a okay. good chunk of time, yeah. and then we ended up going on the road with Third Eye Blind and Vertical Horizon in the summer for for a good chunk of the summer, uh, and then we toured with Vertical Horizon again in the fall quite a bit. So uh, that that kind of was our our first nine months of of touring was was bookended by a lot of spring festivals and then all the the sort of holiday festivals starting in november and december oh, i see um focusing on the record itself what what's your favorite song from that album looking back on it now ah uh, it's a good question um 
You know, I, I always felt like the second single, if I am, yeah. I always, for me, I, I hardly ever fell in love with bands based on their hit. You know, um, mm-hmm. a great example is like uh, Third Eye Blind's first album. I heard Semi Charm Life on the radio and I honestly yeah. thought, I thought it was like a boy band with guitars. <laughs> well, I mean, it does kind of sound, I don't mean this is a negative yeah. thing, but it does kind of no. sound like that with the it harmonies was super and the melodies. catchy yeah. and, yeah. you know, the do, do, do. And I was like, yeah. what is this? Is this like a bunch of like, you know, is this like a boy band that just like, <laughs> put some, you know, but I, I knew it was a great song, but yeah. I didn't, I didn't go by the album or anything. I, I didn't know what to make of it really. I just thought, oh, it's a good yeah. song. But then yeah. I heard, um, how's it going to be? Uh, uh, yeah. Getting yeah. played in a club. And I was like, who is this? And that's the song that I went out and I bought the album. So yeah, that's kind of how it always was for me. Uh, I, 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 I loved bands. I loved albums. So I, in my mind, I always thought if I am would be the song that made people realize, Oh, okay. They're a real yeah. band, you know, yeah. and that, that yeah. was going to be the one that would going to would push us over the edge. Uh, and no, I still, I mean, I love the song and I, I, I had a lot of people over the years tell me how that song meant something to them. Um, but I remember when we put it out as a single, the label was was a little frustrated that it, it wasn't doing better. You know, they thought it was going to do better at radio and on MTV yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And when it didn't, um, they were quick to say, OK, get back in the studio, go make another record. And that was sort of the beginning of us total stereotype total cliche you know you have your one hit and now all of a sudden they're like get off the road and go make another album and we were kind of like what how do we go what do you mean like we we've been in a whirlwind for a year i don't even have a song you know to go put on an album and and it was we we lived that cliche so oh i see do you I mean, why why do you think that wasn't a, a hit? Because, I mean, I know there's there's no real rules, but I don't see why it shouldn't have been. Okay, <laughs> you know, you could say okay, might not have been as big a smash hit as Story of a Girl, mm-hmm. but it, it sounds like a hit to me. You know, it sounds it was very radio mm-hmm. friendly at the same time. Still, you know, catchy chorus. Yeah, you know, who knows? The harmonies uh, are addictive. Yeah, yeah, no idea. But that you know, it's the way it goes. Yeah, I know. Well, I, I think like several songs on that record could could have been successful singles revolve was always my favorite song on it like i always thought revolve if 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 the label had a lot of confidence in us as a band yeah i feel like what they should have done was put out revolve first okay and yeah, yeah, put yeah. it out to rock radio and let people yeah. realize okay this is a band and even if it wasn't a hit, you you established that this is a band, this is a rock band, and then yeah. put out a story of a girl. Uh, but they were just like story, you know, they just saw a story of a girl, they saw a hit, and they just went for it. So we we just kind of all we could do was kind of strap in and go along for the ride. We really had no control over what was happening on the outside. We just were it was you know, here's your itinerary, here's where you're going, here's what you're doing, here's how many radio stations you're visiting today. And, you know, that that's yeah. just what we did. Wow. So so you did you feel like you were forced into trying to write uh what was the next record? It was so happily unsatisfied. Something like yeah. that was that was a follow up. Did you feel like you were rushed into that then? Yeah. I mean, I understand it. You know, I mean, I, they were just thinking, let's let's get another record out there and let's re, you know, kind of restart. But um I, I had a, you know it was a struggle it was a definite struggle to kind of come up with a second record and there just wasn't a lot of um there wasn't a lot of direction from the label as to what they wanted from us and okay. we were we were kind of uh trying to figure out who we were because we were this band that, you know, we weren't a radio band. We never thought of ourselves as a radio band ever. It was never a thing, but then we had this huge hit and all of a sudden you're playing alongside all these other bands that have hits and you start thinking, well, I got to write a hit. And once you start thinking that way, uh, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, And listen, there are gifted songwriters out there who can do it. 
I was yeah. not one of them who could just sit down and crank out a hit again with uh, it, it. It was at that point in my life after the experience I was having, like I, I was definitely trying too hard to figure out what to do instead of just letting it happen. Okay. So you, you don't see there was like a, a potential other career for you that could have happened. Like, you know, you, you know, you get people who are kind of in successful bands and then go on to just like write, hits for pop artists and stuff like well it's like you mentioned sr71 from your tour and i think yeah what's it mitch, mitch is it mitch allen mitch uh, allen like, yeah. yeah i mean obviously he had a career like the kind of well i guess still yeah. does have a career doing that and the guy from semi-sonic i think uh oh god yeah well big he, hits as well hasn't he he got in a room with adele before anybody knew who adele <laughs> was and yeah you are yeah you know there you go you're you're set but uh yeah mitch is a great writer and, and mitch was always really smart about the business uh, from sr71 yeah mitch yeah. was very smart about the business he he knew way more about the sort of how it worked than i did um, okay. I remember we would talk a lot and he produced like their second album. And yeah. so he, he was always keyed in, in a way that uh, clued in is maybe a better way of putting it in a way that I, I kind of wasn't. Um, okay. So I, I think I got much better at being a writer and a crafter of songs and a co-writer years later. It, it, oh, you know, okay. it was, at that time, I, I, it wasn't the right fit for me. Someone so so happily unsatisfied. What did did you ever film a video, or was there ever a planned single yeah. release? No, there was. There was a single. Um, I wrote a song called "Good Friend." Yeah, and I still think "Good Friend" could have been. I don't mean a hit like a giant hit. I just mean I think it could have done really well and propelled the second album. But I think that kind of going back to what I was saying before looking back in hindsight we tried to be a heavier band and yeah. that we shot ourselves in the foot with that and and it was from touring with a lot of bands a lot of rock bands and you know just enjoying being a rock band up on the stage but i think had we paid a little more attention to this, how we were recording the songs and delivering the songs i think good friend could have done really well uh, it's just it was too heavy, you know. It, it was the guitars are too big, and and the, it, it sonically hits a little too heavy for what the song should have been. Um, but they did put that song out. It did get played at radio. It did. It actually did pretty well. And I did a radio tour. I remember it was twenty three cities in like twenty two days or something. Well, and this is back in two thousand two, so it's less than a year after nine eleven. Yeah. And I've got 23 one-way flights booked. So if you can think back, if you were there, or just imagine if you weren't, yeah. if you yeah. had a one-way flight booked, you were flagged. Why are you only going one way? So yes. I got randomly pulled out of the line in the airport 22 times <laughs> because they wanted to check my bags and stuff. So I just, you know, I just remember that it, it was a month of just flying almost every day to a different city to promote this radio single. Um, and it did OK at radio, but uh, yeah. it didn't do well enough. And Epic fell apart shortly after that as a right. label uh, and the album never officially got released. It's a shame. I mean, I, I really like that song, man. I love the lyrics in that song. I always feel it like really, I love the bit when it comes together. I think it's like the second pre-chorus when you say, you basically say something like, there's no better time than today. And like, I just, yeah, I yeah. think I just, I, I think it's um, deserved to be acknowledged more. But um, Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. It is out yeah. there. Funny enough, years later, Epic put it up on iTunes in, in some weird contractual way. I don't know that they're actually allowed to do it because they never paid us for any of the record, oh, but it's there really and I'm not going to fight it. Let it be out there. But uh, it's just yeah. one of those funny, weird head scratching things. Like it just showed up on iTunes one day. So it is there. You can you can listen to it. Oh, okay, I, I'll I'll have to have to purchase it because I just anytime I listen to it, I just you know people always put stuff up on YouTube, so like you can basically yeah. listen to that that entire record yeah. on YouTube, which I think there was quite a few good songs in that record, and like, it's a shame that it wasn't followed yeah. up in the same way. So, so after that experience, did the kind of being basically in a full time band did that did that come apart quite quickly? Like, how was it dealing with that? Uh yeah. Um... 
so trying to go back in my head, I mean, this was two, this is late to the end of 2002. Yeah. Uh, it, it would, it would take me forever to, to walk through the whole thing, but basically, oh, yeah, yeah. No, just sum it up. you know, Epic, Epic kind of folded on us and we had another label that stepped in and wanted to put the album out. So we started negotiating and it just took months and months and months. And it got to a point where, I had seen so many bands that I was a fan of or even friends with that were in a situation similar to what we were in, where you have this album and it doesn't get released. And then you negotiate for two years to get it to release. And I was so determined to not get stuck yeah. that I basically, I, I said to Brian and my band, um, I said, we got to go make another record like immediately. Like we cannot let this kind of define the band. So we went in the studio, we recorded a, a whole brand new album. Uh, we called it Flying the Corporate Jet, which was yep. our sort of shot at, yeah, at yeah, the yeah. corporate system. Um, and, you know, like we just put it out on our own. It was another indie label. It was like going right back to where we were. We put it out as an independent, but it was cathartic. It was something I needed to do. I, I could not be sitting there, you know, with this album just sort of in limbo. So that, that enabled me to feel like I could move on. And after that, I, um, I did like a solo, uh, EP of just yeah. my own stuff. Yeah. Um, and I loved doing that and that was fantastic. And one of those songs wound up going to, uh, another artist, uh, a Disney artist, as a matter of oh, fact. Really? Is, okay. Uh, so that was good. It, it, it helped yeah, yeah. get me in keep me in, in the world of, of songwriting and music. And, um, and then, uh, I noticed you'd mentioned something about slow motion life when we were going back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And that was yeah, a couple yeah. years after. So the, uh, that'll, that takes us to that moment. Okay. Yeah. That was sort of early 2007, I think. Yep. Like yeah. That. Um, yeah. Cause I kind of, you know, tried to get as much music as I could from you guys in those days. So like, I think you mentioned that 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 flying the corporate jet record like that did that include songs like the moment and 29 year old girls yep. maybe yep. yeah 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 so like i i don't know if i ever hold the re heard the record in full but i certainly heard bits of it and and your solo stuff so I, I was kind of like i was always like paying attention to what you guys were doing so like when slow motion life uh part one came out um and you uh, i guess it was girl girl in california was on the on because it still would have been the MySpace days, was up on the MySpace. Yeah, was, oh my I God, yeah, that's it. right. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that now. I feel like this is a few months ago, but did you, because Slow Motion Life Part 2, that never came out officially, is no. that, that's correct. But you did, that's I feel correct. like you put, you did like you put out a song that you said might have been part yeah. of that re quite recently. That's it, right? So the story with the Slow Motion Life Part 1 is that yeah. this is 2007. So this is about, really is about three and a half years after the whole end of of the epic records thing yeah and everybody had kind of done their own thing for a little while we all kind of needed a little break and i just wanted to you know i brought kind of brought the band back together and and i just said look let's let's try something a little different let's get together and, and you had asked earlier about writing songs and i just yeah. said let's not come in with finished songs. Let's just come in with ideas. And as a band, let's just have some fun. Let's see where it goes. Okay. You know, like just come into rehearsals with only ideas and see what happens. And it was really exciting. And we were doing that for like, we'd get together once a week, no pressure, just get together at a studio. And I got this little idea and we would flesh it out for a few hours yeah. and see what happened. Yeah. And we wrote a few songs like that. And then a couple guys in the band got sort of sidetracked. Okay. So people, you know, the, the idea of coming in with ideas wasn't working anymore. So I started, okay, I've got a song. Let me bring in this song. Let me bring in this song. Um, and we had every intention of doing a full album and we went into the studio and we tracked, I want to say we tracked initially a whole album's worth of songs mm -hmm. or close to it. But um Again, there was just a couple of members of the band who had other things going on and it did not come together as a full record. Right. So we said, OK, let's finish this group of songs. And then later, when we get a chance, we'll come back and we'll finish these other ones. And that'll be part two. Um, so we put out part one. And then clearly after that, uh, we just never 
came back to those sure. songs. Uh, sure. And just this past year, the maybe a few months ago, um, a good friend of mine who produced that album was able to dig up uh, a Pro Tools file uh, uh, and mix a song that we had tracked together that the only that. reason that that song didn't come out in 2007 was there was a glitch on the Pro Tools file and we could not fix it. Oh, okay. uh, and I was like, I was so disgusted with the whole thing. I was like, just leave it, forget it. Well, you know, and and anyway, he he pulled it up one day and he was like, hey, I, I did some edits and I fixed this. And I was like, oh my God, it sounds awesome. Let's just put it out. Nice, nice. So that was that. Okay. Um, and then correct me if I'm wrong, but I, as far as I'm aware, the next release you had, you, you had you had an album like 2013 that sounded a bit different. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What, remind me what that album was called again. That was called Something Out of Nothing. Um, that was it. Yeah. And I actually love that album, and the whole sort of driving force of that. There was a few things that happened. Um, Brian from my band had moved down to Nashville a few years before that. And I was taking trips down to Nashville and um, we'd always, so sort of to, to, to go backwards when the band first started, we were very influenced by like Bob Dylan, Neil Young, even Springsteen to a degree. It was a little yeah. more Americana ish. Yeah. Uh, Counting Crows ish yeah. uh, even. And, you know, it evolved into what it evolved into, but um, you know, listen, it's 2013. We're all, were we 40? I think we we're probably pushing 40. And I just was like, I want to make an album. I want to make a different kind of album. I want to make an album that's yeah. a little more acoustic based. So it likes a little more like the band, like Lee Von Helm, Robbie Robertson. And, yeah. you know, really just kind of like strip it down and make it a little bit more acoustic and um, just have some fun with it. So we started working like that and just getting together and playing through some songs and and it was just fun it was just a really great shift of gears and we went down to nashville and we did the whole album down there and uh, i love love that album i it's one of my favorites that i've ever done in my life it, it it's it just feels like everything fits yeah. um we had some great players like some great horn players playing a couple of songs um yeah it's, it's definitely different though yeah, it's, it's it, I mean, it, yeah. Like as you say, it's it's much closer to the the influences you mentioned there, and it's it's removed from the kind of pop rock sound that I guess you're yeah. more famously associated with. Uh, so oh, it's yeah. cool you got to do that, and then and then you had you had another album three years later, which I guess sounded a little more back to the old sound. I would say, yeah, is that, is yeah. That fair. You were just, oh, yeah. was that was that more just like for the for the fun of it again, and you just wanted to try and capture on what you were doing back, back in the day or so here's the great thing about that record uh and, and this will if if you're <clears throat> any artist out there um we were we were talking about making a follow-up record to something out of nothing and we started talking to some managers and somebody brought to our attention that there was a um there, there's a royalty stream called Sound Exchange, which is for artists that are perform on the albums, not songwriting. It's just who performed on it. Mm -hmm. And we realized that uh, we were owed a significant amount of money from Sound Exchange. OK, so um, we had to go through some legal stuff to to get to the, the bottom line with it. But we, we just decided, you know what, rather than kind of taking this 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 money and dividing it up and everybody go here's your share we said why don't we take a nice chunk of this and let's go make an album let's go make oh, a nice. proper album yeah. uh and and uh so that was sort of the the kind of impetus of that and we reached out to jim scott who i was a huge fan of jim scott is a producer uh he had done mixed some of the wilco albums oh, um, wow. okay. like tom petty i mean he's worked on a million amazing albums yeah and um Actually, I, it's funny, you know, you, there's an expression when you cold call someone, when you just call somebody out of the blue with no introduction, but I cold emailed Jim. <laughs> I just okay, emailed him. Okay. Hey, listen, yeah, yeah. I'm a huge fan. This is, this is who I am. This is my, this is what my band did. And are you interested in doing this? And uh, he's a fantastic guy. I ended up having a, just a really great time with him and, uh, you know, get to call him a friend now. And And we definitely wanted to kind of, uh, bring back more of that that pop rock sound that we sure. had done before yeah 
oh yeah that's really cool and totally comes through um and then i guess just going up to the the modern day like where's how what status is nine days now i mean you mentioned doing some music stuff recently is that solo stuff you're doing at the minute what yeah what kind of I'm, I'm i'm focused right now on um i write all the time i i always write songs i've always written songs it's just i can't help it you know they, they yeah. just happen yeah. whether i want them to or not um it's just a matter of how much time do I get to invest in developing them once I write them. And I kind of decided this past fall that I really wanted to do an album of my own. And uh, I got a, a bunch of musicians that I've been working with since November, a fantastic group of players. And I'm hitting the studio in June uh, nice. to record the first batch of songs. And I don't think it's, it's not drastically different than nine days. Um, okay. It's a little different, but yeah, yeah. not by, it's just, you know, it, it, I'm not trying to do something different. It's just, these are the songs I'm writing uh, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm going to play a handful of shows and just kind of enjoy, just enjoy the music for what it is. Oh, cool. I look forward to, I mean, I'm always, always interested in whatever you're doing. So I'll, I'll look forward to that. That music seemed like today, it. definitely. Um, John, I, I, I'm conscious I've taken up quite a lot of your time, but like, is it cool if I just ask a, few, a couple more questions to wrap this yeah, up? Yeah, go ahead. I'm the one who's talking, talking too much, much so no, no, no. Keep this, asking. Is, this is what we want, you know, because <laughs> okay. um, every, you know, we've been doing this show for a few years now, so every now and then you do have a guest where it's just like they'll just give you sort of one or two word answers, and it's like right, right. I've got to hold a conversation with this person <laughs> for a bit. But um, so the opposite of that's always good that's good i mean and you're not too much and then you get someone who's too much the opposite way and right. you're the you're the perfect balance and i appreciate that <laughs> oh you're too kind all right <laughs> um so i mean it's quite people who are fans of you will be um aware that you you went into teaching um mm -hmm. you, so you you still work as a teacher now yeah i've been teaching for 15 years high school english of all things yeah right right and um I'm just, people can YouTube this if they're not aware, but I know there are set videos that exist online of you performing a certain Yeah, hit too to many of those videos. There are too many of those, uh, by the way. That's why I kind of stopped actually bringing my guitar to the classroom because I'm like, <laughs> we don't need any more videos of me doing this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, does that, with with each kind of cohort each year, um, do, do, is it quite common that, that kids will still say, hey, I, I've, I've heard of you from that band. Does that happen less and less or is it still, is that quite a steady thing still? Like, It's 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 pretty steady, although there's been a whole lot going on this this past school year with with the movie and with oh, Jordy. And yeah. So yeah. it's definitely a bit more on the radar. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but you know, it, it's, it's all good. I mean, it's never, it's never really a distraction to be honest, you know? Uh, so it, it's just all good stuff. And I suppose it's kind of nice that you've, you've obviously had a big taste of the music industry, like, you know, being a rock yeah. star or whatever, had that life. But now but at the same time, as you say, you've been a teacher for 15 years, you've kind of had a different kind of career, one where you're not away from your family all the time and stuff. Yep. So yeah, I mean, that, that was, that must feel nice, right? That was key. I mean, uh, long story short, you know, when I was a senior in high school, I had this English class. It was called College Reading, College Prep with Mr. Kozira. And I'd always loved English. I mean, I was always a big reader and I was always trying to write. So it was always it was easy for me. I, I loved it. But that class, I just always remember I'd be sitting in that class as a senior in high school and thinking to myself, you know, if I if I can't be a rock star, I want to do what this guy does. Like I, I loved okay. you know sort of digging into novels and, you know, looking at all these different angles and, and what is this writer trying to tell us and, you know, the symbolism of things. I just always loved that. And uh, there's actually a lot of parallels between being up on a stage and, and projecting to a crowd yep. and teaching. Uh, it, it's amazing how the parallels are there. So I, I'm very fortunate that I got to do both of these things and, um, a big part of it was, you know, starting a family with my wife and I, I just was kind of yeah. freaking out that I didn't want to be absent from my kids. Of course. So of course. it worked yeah. out great. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, it's funny that you say that. Like, um, so I, I, I did a teaching course many years ago. I did. It wasn't the career I went into uh, mm -hmm. in the end, but I remember like a friend on the course who was like a singer songwriter being in bands and stuff. And he was just like, right. I'm doing this as well, because it's like it's a 
you know, there's parallels. It's like, yeah. it's a bit like being on a stage. It is. So, uh, it really yeah, is. It's, it's funny that you say that too. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. So I, before we wrap this up, I've got um, just a couple of like quick fire questions, if that's, sure. if that's okay with you. But yeah, just yeah. before I dive into them, just wanted to kind of just ask a very random thing. Cause I guess, so like this podcast, it's mainly, you know, it's alternative music and we, we have had, people in different genres or whatever but like i'd say 90 percent of the artists we have are kind of from the sort of um less than jake mhpx mm -hmm. bling 182 that that kind of genre of music sure. which you know as, as you said like when i was asking about less than jake earlier you, you weren't you weren't really in that scene but then at the same time you know you taught with sr71 who had you know arguably one of the biggest pop punk hits of those of those days and yeah. stuff um yeah, I mean, are, are, are you like, were you personally a fan of any of that kind of music at all? Was because obviously the influences you mentioned are separate from that. But like, yeah, like in your late twenties around that time, were you just were you ever into that kind of stuff, or was it just kind yeah, of like, I, yeah? Oh, I mean, I I've always been a song guy, meaning okay. if if it's a great song, I'm, I I love songs. You know, I love melody. Um, yeah. And, and and I love clever songwriting. I mean, there's a lot of of the sort of pop punk stuff that owes it some debt to like an Elvis Costello, you know, who of course, of is course. super clever and super melodic. And and uh, so I, I think that again, to to not sort of digress into it too much, I always was a little sort of bit of an old soul in a way. So by the time I'm 24, I feel like yeah. I'm 40. You know, okay, so okay. I, I, a lot of the if you were even just a couple of years younger than me, mm -hmm. I would probably thought this these are kids, you know. Um, okay. So a lot of that music as it was as it was coming up, it felt like a new thing to me that I was already. Not that I was too old, don't get me wrong, but it yeah. felt more like, oh, this is for the kids. You know, okay. And okay. which it, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of funny to say that now I was in my 20s, you know, but yeah, yeah, I always yeah. sort of felt like my era of music existed before all that new stuff. So it was right. it was always a, a bit of an interesting thing. Even touring with SR71, they were clearly more pop punk, if you want to call it that, than yeah. we were. Um, yeah. But we got along great and we were all similar ages and we had similar experiences um, but I, I did feel that we were a little different than those bands and, and that's that not to say it was better. It just felt a little different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I think of you guys, I think of you as something different from that world for sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the only, uh, the, the band I can think of who we've had on the show who are kind of like sort of in both worlds who you might have toured with. Did you ever tour with Eve six ever? You know, we never toured with them. I think we played a handful of festivals with them. Okay. Um, I don't know those guys. I, I probably said a few words over over the over the years to them at shows, yeah. but they it's funny because we one of the AR guys we were talking to was Eve Six AR guy. And I remember okay. talking about Eve Six right as that song was kind of coming out. I think that's right about when we were uh we were kind of going through that process. Yeah. Um, makes sense. So yeah. Yeah, he was actually it was the singer we spoke to. He was he was hilarious and he's he's sort of become this kind of internet celebrity. He's like yeah. the king of Twitter and stuff, which doesn't surprise me from No, I I check his stuff on Twitter all the time. No, he's hysterical. It's yeah, good stuff. He is, he's hilarious. Um okay, cool. Yeah. So I'll I guess I'll I'll fire a couple of quick fire questions at you and then yeah. we can then we can wrap this up. Sure. Yeah. Um okay, let's go for it. Uh favorite TV show. Oh boy, that's a good one. Uh, my favorite it over history is probably going to be a tie between Lost. Okay, yeah, love that show. Um, Sopranos is awesome. Um, and the early, maybe the first ten years of The Simpsons, nothing's going to beat that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still holds up today. I mean, oh, anything God, after that first ten years is yeah. horrible watching. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I still rotate that on Disney Plus. Uh, favorite film. Oh God! I should have known this was coming. I am the worst at these favorite questions, by the way. I I can't do it. But all right, if I had to pick one, I'm probably going to go with Jaws. Uh, it's okay. just a Classic. perfect film uh, in every way. I love it. I named my son. One of my sons is named Brody after Chief Brody. Oh, nice. So there you go. Um, 
But there's so many films I'm I'm a huge fan of. Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, the first Star Wars is just like, uh, you know, it's got that's my generation. I'm a Gen Xer. These movies hit me like a ton of bricks and they stayed with me forever. So, okay, okay. Um, Favorite city to play a show in? Oh, that's a good one. Um, You know what? I'm going to go with Chicago. Um, Being a New Yorker, I love New York and I love Long Island and there's great places to play. But uh, whenever we would play home shows, there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of like, who's coming to the show? Who who can you get on the guest list? And I almost was always like, I can't wait to get out of here because it was so stressful. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah, it was hard to really enjoy it. So uh, Chicago was always this great second home for us. And and I didn't have quite the same pressures on me. Uh, So I'm going to go with Chicago. Okay, that makes sense. Third Eye Blind or Counting Crows? Uh, I'm going to go with Counting Crows, but the first Third Eye Blind album Mm -hmm. is rock perfection yeah you know like it is 90s rock whatever you want to call it it's post grunge um Mm -hmm. but it it is eric valentine like engineered and and co-produced that album and man he brought something the original guitar player kevin uh i believe it's cadigan is how you pronounce it but that guy man was amazing the the combination was amazing but in terms of like you know uh, through an entire career uh august and everything after is also perfection and it adam durrett it is continues to just be this amazing artist and uh yeah. I, I listen either one either one's a winner but uh, i'm okay. gonna go with the uh, counting crows okay all right getting towards the end i promise favorite author cormac mccarthy Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Nice, uh, nice. He, I love him. He's got it. You know, I, I read a ton of Stephen King and I still love Stephen King. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Cormac McCarthy is is my favorite author. Okay, nice. Um, this is this isn't really a quick fire question. It's just a, a lot. So when I was trying to think of quick fire questions before and I was my wife was helping me out. She wanted me to ask you this one because she just thought okay. it, but she wanted to know if like because she was looking at how famous people have just done like have randomly been busking or whatever or done an open mic or whatever have, have you ever i mean i know we talked about you playing in front of your class or whatever but have you ever kind of like turned up to an open mic or like ended up just busking somewhere random and like you know play played like story of a girl or whatever and people didn't what didn't realize that it was the guy doing it oh god i got i don't you know what i think i did like a Probably the the best equivalent to that I can think of is, and I don't know if this, they have this over where you guys are, but there's all these amusement parks here and they all have like a video booth where you can go in and kind of do, like you can sing a song, they'll have the music and you can record yourself singing it and all oh, this fun okay. stuff. Okay. So I did one time go in and do Story of a Girl in the booth. <laughs> right. uh, and, and so, but here's the kicker. I've been singing that song my whole life in the key of G. So okay. it starts yeah, yeah, with yeah. the vocal. This yeah. is the story. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I went in and I'm like, oh God, I got I'm I'm being all funny and I'm gonna I'm gonna do this one and see if anybody realizes it. Not realizing that the recording that they did was not in the key of G. So I started <laughs> and I, the music kicks in in a different key and it took yeah. me, you know, a few seconds to catch it. I'm like, that was god awful. I hope nobody knows that <laughs> me. That was pretty funny. <laughs> nice. um, yeah, listen, John, I will uh, let you get on your way. Thanks again uh, for giving us some of your time on the Sunday. Like, massively appreciate that. Uh, this uh, has been a really cool one it. for me because I've been listening to your music for 23 years now. And yep. um, yeah, it's it, it's cool to meet you, albeit uh, virtually. Um, yeah, well, I appreciate yeah. it. And uh, we'll, we're, we'll stay in touch now. And when I've got some new awesome. music, I'll definitely send it over. I'd love to know what Please you think. Do. Please do. All right, cool. Um, Yeah, this has been a good one. Thanks so much, man. Thank you. Take care, man. Cheers, John.